Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'm Lisa Muscatine, co-owner of Politics and Prose, and along with my husband and co-owner, Brad Graham, right here, and our fabulous staff here, we're so happy to welcome all of you to um, this afternoon's event. And um, just as a measure of how important this event is to me personally, I am missing the 49ers Chiefs game right now to be here <laughs> as a lifelong Bay Area 49ers person. So I know that doesn't usually go over well in a bookstore, but I just wanted to share that little tidbit. Um, and I, I, I want to just uh, start by saying how one of the great things about owning a bookstore is that you often, especially in Washington, is you get to host friends who have done wonderful things in various professions who then write books. And then you get to invite them to speak at your own very bookstore. And um, it's really especially great when you really love the friend, but they've also written a really important good book. And that is definitely um, the case with Todd Stern. Um, Todd and I go way back. Uh, we worked together in the Clinton White House um, and became even better friends after he made the extremely brilliant, probably best decision of his life, which was to marry another colleague of ours, Jen Klein, who's right here. Um, who has been a dear, dear friend and also colleague of mine for many years. And I just feel very grateful to have had the pleasure of knowing you both for a really long time now. So uh, that's why I'm saying it's just such a delight for me personally and for Politics and Prose to help, uh, help Todd launch the beginning of, well, the beginning. It's, I guess it's been a couple weeks now. A week? Two weeks. To launch his, his first book, um, it's called Landing the Paris Climate Agreement, How It Happened, Why It Matters, and What Comes Next. I also should say that one of their sons, their middle son, Zachary, is also here. So thank you for coming, Zachary. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> just speaking about uh, how this book came to be, I think Todd may be the only person on the planet capable of untangling the web of politics, policies, people, and pressures that marked the 20 years leading up to the signing of the Paris Climate Agreement. For eight years, he served as US Special Envoy for Climate Change at the State Department under Secretaries Hillary Clinton and John Kerry. Uh, and in that role, he was President Obama's chief climate negotiator, which is to say, sorry, he was in all the rooms where it happened from start to finish. Um, Todd is too modest to brag about the skills re required to do this job. Um, but suffice it to say that to pull off an agreement of this magnitude, the US Special Envoy had to be astute enough to assess the psychologies of his counterparts from dozens, almost a couple hundred countries around the world. He had to understand the intricacies of climate science and climate policy. He had to enjoy the chess game of negotiating. And of course, he had to remain cool under duress. Todd was able to navigate his way through all these challenges with intelligence, grace, and aplomb uh, because he had brought to the job years of experience as a lawyer, as a political advisor, as the White House staff secretary under President Clinton. I don't know how many of you know what's involved with that job, but let me just say it's hard. Um, and he also, of course, was an expert on global environmental issues. So he's been around the block of law and politics and policy and diplomacy more than a few times. In his book, Landing the Paris Climate Agreement, Todd takes the reader behind the scenes and shares insights about how a negotiator must op operate to succeed. When do you soft pedal and when do you twist arms? When do you parry and when do you bluff? How do you determine who is trustworthy and who isn't? When do you know that a deal is finally maybe within reach? This book tells the whole, whole tale in all its fascinating complexity. And in so doing, Todd renders history from the vantage point of someone actually making history, someone who knows how it happened and why it matters. And if you don't believe me, I just want to mention that Todd has gotten some really lovely reviews already in the Financial Times and Science uh, Magazine and also in Earth.org. Um, so check those out as well. We are delighted that in conversation with Todd this afternoon will be award-winning journalist and author, Ju Juliet Eilprin. She is the deputy climate and environment editor at the Washington Post. She's also a very familiar uh, presence here at PNP. She's an author herself. Many of you have read her work as a journalist in the Post, which includes a Pulitzer Prize for, ex uh, for explanatory reporting in 2020. 
Since starting at the Post in 1998, Juliet has covered national affairs, the White House, Congress, and in addition to environmental issues. I just mentioned she's an author. She's written two books, Demon Fish, about the human relationship to sharks, and Fight Club Politics, about the poisonous partisan politics uh, uh, that define the current House of Representatives. So I guess you could say she's actually written two books about sharks. Um, in any case, we are in for a fascinating discussion over the, uh, over the next hour. We're so grateful to have uh, Todd and Juliet here. Please join me in welcoming Todd Stern and Juliet Alpin to Politics and Prose. Thanks so much for that great introduction. OK. So Todd, let's start with the fact that there are many people, including I would imagine some in this audience, who have spent their careers either in lifelong diplomacy or in working on climate change. And in fact, that does not describe you. You did other things before kind of edging your way into, uh, into uh, doing climate diplomacy and making that central to your career. So it, could you talk a little about that transition and kind of what you took from these other jobs and your experience and how you, as starting as an outsider, ended up being in the middle of this world. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, thank you to, um, to both of you and for that uh, lovely introduction. Thank you to everybody who has showed up here. I'm very delighted to see you all. Um, thank you to Juliet for agreeing to do this. Um, so. The, you know, I think I, I had training as a lawyer, which I suppose was to some extent useful. But um, but what I think uh, is more useful is the time that I was uh, in the Clinton White House, and because that's a, that's a place where you learn, if you don't already know it, the sort of the art of uh, of um, the the intersection of policy and politics, uh, and you've that's just your that's sort of just the air you breathe every day. Um, and I came in as John Podesta's deputy initially as staff secretary, and then when John left, I moved up. And always in, uh, in at that time, uh, we were pulled into other special assignments. Let's say um, the first special assignment was the uh, um, famous travel office mess. If any of you here remember that, and John and I were uh, were tapped tapped to do the internal investigation, which made us the two least popular people in the, uh, in the, in the White House. Hearing our steps coming down the hall was always, was always a bad thing. But, uh, but all of that kind of stuff was, uh, was useful. Um, and uh, I, I first got into political, you know, political stuff in the 1988 uh, presidential campaign for Dukakis, which obviously didn't go that well, but I learned a lot. Um, so I, the, the actual way I got into climate, though, was not because I said, gee, this is what I want to do. This is the thing I'm, uh, I, I want to switch into. And the staff secretary is kind of a mile wide and a couple inches deep. You know, every, you know something about everything that comes through the White House, because everything that's going to the president comes to you first. Uh, and um, so that's what I was doing. Uh, and in... Uh, maybe the summer, summer of 1997, um, President Clinton had gone to, the, to what was then the G8 in Denver, and he came back quite annoyed because all of his counterparts were talking about Kyoto and what they were going to do in Kyoto, and he was sort of uh, like, why don't I know what we're going to do in Kyoto? And, and so the answer to, to the question um, was, we better get somebody else involved, and, uh, and I got tapped. I think I got tapped... I mean, this is what I've heard. I think it's probably right, because I think Bob Rubin had something to do with it. He was over at, at Treasury then. Uh, there was kind of a battle between the economic and the uh, environmental parts of the administration over exactly you know, how much to promise the United States was going to do. And, uh, and Rubin uh, was a, always a big fan of the Sec Secretary's office when, when he was still at, at the White House and thought I would be a straight shooter, and I wouldn't lean, lean either way. So they asked me if I would do this, and I said, and they wanted me to do um, the outreach and the communications piece of this. And I said, I'll do the outreach and communications piece if I can be on the policy side also. So they said yes, 
and sort of the rest is history. Then I got involved, and then it, I, it kind of never let me go. Thanks. Um, so much of your book is really about relationships with other people and how you, everyone was, you know, how you were dealing with them and how, how you could bring this agreement to fruition. And towards the end of your book, you talk about wandering the halls of Le Bouget in the final hours of the talks in 2015 and how you kept running into delegates from other countries, some of whom had been allies and some of whom had been foes. And you write, the debates and disagreements are certainly real, but so is the recognition by the, those of us in the thick of it that we were all working for our countries, enmeshed in a tense, high stakes, difficult game. And in most cases, were people worthy of respect and a touch of friendship. Uh, I was hoping you could elaborate on that. How, you know, what was that dynamic like and how does one navigate that? Well, I mean, one of the joys of, of, this, of this job in many respects was dealing with all sorts of people, sometimes becoming very good friends, sometimes, you know, friend, friendships that have uh, lasted, you know, well, well past uh, my time there. Um, I think I was, I, I remember that that walk because it was it, it was a very strange feeling. There was like nothing else to do, and uh, I wasn't used to not having something to do, it, particularly in, in climate negotiations. Somewhere between seventeen and twenty four hours a day, right? And um, and and it's quiet, and there's like nothing kind of going on, and I'm just kind of wandering the halls, and I would poke my head in there and poke my head in there, but I also ran into um, several people from the hardest line antagonists to, uh, to the United States, but also the sort of the side of, the, of these negotiations that we were on, but also the United States per se. Um, a, a real firebrand from uh, Malaysia was, was one of them, uh, and, and who had just attacked us mercilessly at, at various times. And I guess maybe with things kind of already sort of winding down, there was just a sense that, um, and so, so we stopped and talked and laughed and, and chatted, and, and I did this with a few other people, and, and I think that's what gave rise to that, yeah. to that paragraph, because it, um, it, it's true. I mean, you can be ready to, to strangle somebody uh, in, the, in the context of, uh, of, of trying to get where we need to, we needed to go, but, uh, and I, I always thought the notion that people might think, oh, so how can you be friends with that person? Is it just a charade? It's like, it's not a charade. That's real, but it's also real that you see the humanity in, in the people you're dealing with. Um, and I, I will say we're going to talk about a central character, Xi Jinping, in your in your book, um, who's the lead Chinese negotiator. I will say that as someone who I think one of the hardest things when I write a story is describing someone accurately. I mean, or, or capturing them. And you have really vivid descriptions of yeah, so many thank different you. Thank you. Uh, negotiators. So your description of Xi is this way. He smiles broadly, laughs easily, and when he gets angry, his face turns a deep shade of red and he jabs the air in a sharp staccato. Over the years, we argued, reasoned, wrestled, laughed, and persevered. We became good friends. Um, clearly, there is no more important relationship when it comes to climate change than the US and China, and, and you two were really tasked in, in, in brokering uh, a deal that was central to the Paris Agreement. Uh, so could you talk a bit particularly about your relationship and how you were able to, the two of you were able to make progress on that front? Yeah, um, and what, what you said is true. I mean, I, if the, there, there's, no, there's no bilateral relationship in the world more important than the US and, uh, and China. And, um, and she and I were kind of the, you know, the main people for, for our countries. I, I liked Shia. We liked each other right away. Um, I met him in uh, in March of 2009. I had gone to China and a few other countries uh, with Hillary Clinton on her first trip as uh, as secretary. At, but and we'd gone to China, but Shia was not there at, at the time. So I, I met him in Washington in, in March. Um, and uh, I said to him actually in that very first meeting uh, that I thought that he and I could make climate change a positive pillar, was the words I use, a positive pillar in the relationship, which was not as strained as it is now, but it wasn't easy. And it was, and it was you know, there was no way in which we were, we were partners on climate change. So he didn't say no. Um, and, uh, and 
we started off then. He asked me what I thought that, um, that China should, what, what did I want China to do? And I said, I'm not ready to tell you that yet. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it the next time we're together. And we were, we were together again in June uh, in, in, in China. And uh, so he said, so what do you think? And I gave him a list of like some fairly tough things to do. And he said, that is completely unrealistic. <laughs> um, but we, so I, we, we, we got to be friendly almost right away. We liked each other. Uh, and, um, but in that first year, we didn't make a lot of progress because China was really dug in. But as, as an illustration of our good friendship, um, there's a story that's in the book that I have to tell you guys, um, which is that um, Jen and I are driving in the car with uh, this guy, uh, then Zachary, then aged uh, nine, and Ben, aged four. And we're driving around, and it's sort of lunchtime, and uh, Zachary wants to go to Panera Bread, and Ben is dug in against it. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. And Zachary finally says, OK, fine. We won't, get to, we won't go to Panera Bread, but I get to pick where we're going to dinner. We'll, get, we'll go to Surfside. And ben, said, ben looks at him. He's four years old. He says, I agree with you about lunch, but not about dinner. <laughs> And I and I and I say to Jen, he's getting lessons from Minister Shia. So, so then it's it's September, early September in 2009, and Shia and his team are are in Washington, and we're we're getting ready ready to sit down and and meet in our um, windowless conference room where we spent all of our time. And uh, and but we're so we're sort of standing around. So I tell him that exact story. And I tell him the whole thing, and he just bursts out laughing. He's red the way he gets, and but and he says, "No, no, no! He learned from his daddy." <laughs> uh, so, and we didn't make progress that year, but the relationship was building. Uh, and I think that, I mean, I actually think that there was more progress made starting in the next year and years after that because they had tried. The Chinese had tried the attack of going hard against us and hard, hard against where we were trying to go. And in, in such a way, in, in, in the 2009 Copenhagen uh, conference, there's a con for those of you who don't know, there's a climate conference every year. They're often referred to as COPs because they're the conference of the parties. So, so this was like the COP in, in, uh, in Copenhagen. And he had not just gotten way crosswise with us and, and fought too much and fought too publicly with us. But, uh, but the bigger sin from their point of view is that they got on the wrong side of poor developing countries. Mm -hmm. And it had just gone badly for them. And I think that they came out, I mean, I don't know this, but my sense was certainly that they sort of did a review back, uh, back in Beijing. And it was a little bit of a, a friendship, um, you know, uh, uh, effort um, uh, when uh, when they came back and and but again we the friendship was already there but but they started to it wasn't ever easy but we started we didn't get in the same places that we that we were in before we went made little bits of progress bit at a time but not so much going back um, and then another central figure would be someone people are much more familiar with, Barack Obama, um, who, you know, I think most people would say played a really critical role in his first year as president, and then a much more central role at the very end. Um, and again, some I think f folks here probably are might be aware of when, uh, you know, he, along with yourself and Secretary Clinton, crashed a meeting of uh, you know multiple you know the it's leaders on, of it's on the cover yes of the book. there you go <laughs> of of China Brazil India and South, South Africa. Africa right so but maybe you, if you you know you obviously chronicle it throughout the book but you know what is something that you think maybe folks sitting here wouldn't know about especially maybe in the run up to Paris yeah. what what Obama did that that actually made a difference? Well, uh, the President Obama was, um, was really very committed from, from the, from the get-go on climate change and saw it as, uh, as important. Um, the, uh, and he was, he was actually completely crucial to getting the deal done to the extent that it got done, which wasn't complete, but, but it was hugely important in, uh, in Copenhagen. Um, he, I, I think that he uh, sort of later in uh, in his uh, administration 
uh, was oh, and certainly in the Paris year, very focused. Well, look, the year before that, so the year before that, 2014, was an enormously important year because it was the year of this special, what, what became known as the joint announcement between the United States uh, and, and China, which was all born by when we had had a pretty good year with China administration-wide in, in, uh, in 2013, or with respect to climate change in 2013, and John Kerry at, at that point was, you know, was uh, the Secretary of State. And, uh, and good things had happened during the year, so then that's January of, of 2014, and he calls me up to his office, and uh, he basically says, what do we do for an encore? Like, that was good, but like, we, we want to keep going. So I said, that makes sense. Let me talk to my team. I'll come back to uh, the next day. And, and I did. And the, and the proposal was that the US and China, uh, President Obama and President Xi, would, uh, who were going to be together in, um, in November of, uh, of 2014, would, would have jointly announce what their targets, their emission reduction targets, would be uh, for Paris uh, in China. And sort of like the two big 800 gorillas traditional opponents would walk down the, the red carpet together in Beijing. Um, and uh, and I, I actually initially thought, I was, I was one, of the, one of the people on my team came up with this, I sort of thought the Chinese are never going to do that because they're never going to want to get crosswise with their, uh, with their allies in the climate world who, who tend to be against us. But, but almost as soon as I said that, I thought, except they might think it's really important in ways beyond climate change for the overall relationship for uh, what, what President Xi then, then called his little buzzwords were a, a new form of major power relations, which means that, you know, well, we don't have to go into that. But um, so Obama was very important uh, in, 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 in making that happen. He, uh, he, he talked to Xi about it when they, when a couple of times when they were together and he wrote le uh, letters to Xi. And he and he was sort of all in uh, on uh, on that. Um, he went to uh, he went off to the Arctic in 2015 um, and got himself a cover uh, of Rolling Stone um, to look at uh, to look at um, sort of the impacts of climate change uh, there. And and then he was lobbying people. I mean, he, I, I was in a meeting with him um, with a bunch of business uh, leaders, sort of uh, mid-level business people uh, in the Roosevelt Room. Probably uh, early fall of 2015, uh, and he started off saying, uh, "You know, I work on a lot of hard issues, uh, and I work on a lot, a lot of issues that can pe keep people up on at night. But other than nuclear weapons, uh, climate change is the only issue I work on that has the capacity to alter the course of human progress." I, that was pretty serious. I mean, that's 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 where he was, and he 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 had many conversations during the course of that year with Xi Jinping, and with he met twice with Modi, once in Washington, and then he went to to India. So, um, so he was he was hugely important. Yeah. Okay, we're going to talk about both the potential and then the ways in which the Paris Agreement has yet to deliver. So describing it, you write, Paris doesn't guarantee success because it cannot. And then you detail its architecture, which you obviously worked very hard on, and you conclude it gives us a chance. Can you elaborate on how this agreement, which absolutely cannot guarantee outcomes, still is consequential? Yeah, I thought so. O Obama used that metaphor of chance a lot in the way he he described uh, described um, Paris after it got done, uh, and I always thought I mean, he 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 wrote it on a copy of the of the uh, agreement that he um, signed for my team. Uh, he he talked about it. Um, I think. Soon after, uh, soon after the deal got done, I always thought that was the right way to look at things because uh, you 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 can't look at an agreement like this and say uh, that you know if 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 Paris is not having the effect of immediately solving this problem, well, we got to get a new agreement. The agreement's flawed. It doesn't work. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, the, uh, in particularly in an agreement that needed to be structured in the way that it was structured, 
So I think that, that if Paris is working well, Paris is going to put the right kind of pressure on countries. If countries are working well, they're going to they're going to take the right kind of steps that will make Paris stronger. Paris can make the country stronger, and the countries can make Paris stronger if it's working well. All right. Now, now we're going to talk about some of the issues which you continue to work on. Hmm. All right. So you know the world is is you know likely to pass, to essentially bust through the most idealistic goal in Paris of limiting warming of the earth to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, by the early 2030s, we're living in it right now. We have been living in it for a year, but obviously it's not an extended year. But so, um, you know, the earth is on track to warm by 2.7 degrees Celsius by the um, end of the century, right? Which is better than it was, but uh, absolutely, uh, you know, considered catastrophic by scientists. Um, there's a surge in new oil and gas exploration this year, uh, which could release nearly 12 billion metric tons of planet warming emissions, um, equivalent to China's annual output. Um, the, the United States leads the world in that, along with the UK, Australia, Canada, or Norway, accounting for half of the planned expansion of fossil fuels. Um, BP, which says it supports it this month, abandoned a target to reduce oil and gas production by 2030. Um, with the CEO saying that they're shifting course. Um, then there's also aids to developing countries. But so when you look at that, and obviously it's something you grapple with and you write about, how, how do you look at the trajectory that the world is on right now vis-a-vis -vis what this long-standing international effort has been trying to achieve? So as I look, I mean, we're talking about the, 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 the present and the future right now. Um, when I look uh, at the sort of the climate landscape that, that we have in front of us, I, I basically see it in terms of three major factors. The first is that the science, in terms of actual uh, scientific reports and analysis, and then even more in terms of what we see out our window every day all over the world, which is pretty much biblical weather. I mean, weather that is more extreme, again, than anybody thought even, if I, I jumped into climate change all the way back in the, in the late 1990s, nobody was thinking about it like that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, so science and impacts. The second thing is uh, the progress that's being made in terms of clean technology, which in the last 10 years, has been nothing short of spectacular. I mean, completely spectacular. Way beyond, like light years beyond what the best modelers and, and, and analysts were thinking years ago. I mean, if you look at you know, one, one technology after another, whether it's solar, wind, batteries, electric vehicles, uh, electric heat pumps, you sort of see costs going like this and uptake going like that, fabulous. So all of that is great. And if there wasn't a third factor that I'm going to get to in a minute, I would look at uh, I would look at that and say, you know, we have a kind of a half a chance to get in the ballpark of uh, of net zero emissions somewhere in the range of, of 2050. Probably not exactly on any of those uh, any any of those numbers, but but in the ballpark. But the third factor is the obstacles. And the obstacles are first and foremost the fossil fuel industry. And the fossil fuel industry, both because of what they produce and because of the influence that they have with governments all over the world. And that's, that's the hardest thing that we're facing right now. And uh, I think, again, that if you, if you look at, at the, if you look at what we can do, I mean, what we're doing and what we can do, if the obstacles could be you know, kind of tamped down enough. You, I, I, I would never describe myself, and I never did when I was no, negotiating. People would ask me, "Are you, are you an optimist or a pessimist?" And I always say, "Neither." I'm like kind of right in the middle. Um, like we can do a lot, and we might not do it if we do it wrong. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm not. I'm certainly not not here to say like, "Don't worry, you're wrong. It's all going great." No, it's. I mean, it, it, it's problematic in, in lots of ways, but. But the breakthroughs that we're seeing, and and the and the break, and, in, and even in areas where the breakthroughs haven't happened yet, there's such a ph phenomenal, innovative culture out there that is, whether we're talking about heavy industry like like steel and cement and things like that, 
we're getting there. We can do those things. The, the problem is, um, you know, the problem is what I said. And uh, I'll ask a couple more questions and then we'll open it up because I know folks here will have plenty of questions for you as well. But one is, so the other, the other area where the agreement has failed to fully deliver is in the $100 billion, uh, you know, of, of aid to developing countries. And, you know, one of the things that I think is so fascinating about these negotiations is that you bring together 190 odd countries and everyone has a voice. Everyone at that moment speaks. And for so many of these countries, you have this existential threat that has become even worse to the point that, you know, and I will tout our own reporting, you know, Chico Harlan just did a, a piece the other day about he traveled to Dominica, which has been battered by extreme weather. And because the world has not delivered on what it promised to, to give Dominica in the wake of Hurricane Ida, uh, they sell citizenship to anyone who can pay $200,000 a pop. And that is the predicament that these worlds are in. And obviously, you grappled with a lot of these questions, how to navigate this issue of how we describe the loss and damage that, that poor nations face and to what extent should the countries that became rich by uh, you know, releasing carbon pollution bear responsibility for that. And so my question is, when you now look back, and these have been really central to negotiations past your time in office, do you reassess any decisions that were made by you and your team, or is there anything that you take away having worked so intensively on this about how to, to square these really difficult uh, questions. Well, I'd like to take up the part that you started with on the importance of, of finance in the whole equation, because I, th I actually think that is the single biggest issue um, with respect to climate change going forward. I also can't help but say for people who don't realize like the full um, sort of monstrous difficulty of these negotiations, that those 190 countries all have to agree. The, 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 the essential rule of decision uh, in climate change uh, negotiations is consensus. So maybe out of the 195 countries, two or three small ones could could be complaining, and the you know the president of that year's COP will look around and say, "See no objections," and hit the hit the gavel down. But you can't do that more with you know any even a small amount of opposition. So that's hard. Anyway, let me let me let me move to to finance. Um, the the need to get way larger amounts, like order of magnitude larger amounts of uh, of capital going to uh, to uh, developing countries around the world is manifest. Uh, back at the, in two thousand nine, part of the the reason that the Copenhagen Accord got done to the extent that it did get done uh, was a promise by developed countries to provide a hundred two. Uh, mobilize $100 billion a year by 2020, which they came short of doing sort of 80 something billion. And, but, but I think by 2023, they had done that. And in Paris, there was an agreement that that 100 billion by 2020 would continue past 2020 to 2025. And then there would be another dis, uh, decision uh, on, on what, would, what new number would, would, um, would uh, would come after the hundred billion, and it wouldn't be less than a hundred. So that was the basic. That was basically the, the way things have laid out uh, in in the UNFCCC in the in the climate body. And the biggest issue for the COP this year is is going to be what's that new number. And there is a only semi coherent conversation going on about this, which is typically the way finance conversations go on in the UNFCCC because there's no expertise there. Like there's very, very little expertise. So you have, you know, some players saying, having looked at the um, a whole set of reports that have been done by, you know, very uh, solid, uh, smart people um, saying that, uh, that over the next X years, there, there needs to be a, not a hundred million. There needs to hundred billion. There needs to be a trillion or two trillion. Yeah. And you've got certain countries now saying, "Well, the hundred billion now needs to become a trillion," which is obviously not possible. The place where the really good work is being done on finance is uh, is in the G20. Um, they've done the last three G20s have done a lot. The best the best uh, um, report that's that has come out of that process is the Triple Agenda, which was done 
in the Indian G20 last year and authored by Larry Summers and, and, and N.K. Singh, um, an Indian economist. And the, the, the point I'm making here is you, we've, get, we've got to get through, the, the, the negotiators this year will have to get through some kind of resolution of a number that's not going to be the number that people want to hear because the number people want to hear is, is just not doable in this context. But what we really ought to see is the deep and profound reform in places like the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks. Uh, and uh, if you, what, you, what you would need to have that happen is Harris to get elected, Harris to take on in, in, the, in the, the course of her transition to understand the magnitude of this issue mm -hmm. for being able to solve uh, climate change or deal with climate change. Um, the, the degree to which this could be a legacy issue if she did it, and then to round up other shareholders of the World Bank, so U.S., but you know, you know Europeans and others, uh, and uh, and then to see if the World Bank president that we have now, who's a hell of a lot better than the previous one, see if he's willing to really undertake profound cultural change uh, in, in his and related institutions. That's how you could start to get mm -hmm. on target. And then th what happens there could be reported back into mm -hmm. the UNFCCC, but it's got to fundamentally take place, in my opinion, okay. in other places. OK. And I want other people to ask questions. Uh, so we have a microphone right there. Um, and if no, one asks you, uh, if no one else asks you about Trump, I'll ask you about Trump. But I have a feeling that's going to come up. So. Um, one of my proudest moments in my years as the um, World Bank's Global Environment Program Manager for East Asia was when we um, uh, agreed to and then helped China implement a project to reduce the cost of solar PV panels. It was very successful. Yeah. Then the U.S. slapped a tariff on importing China PV panels. Subsequently, it slapped a tariff on importing cheap US, uh, Chinese electric automobiles. So those are two major disappointments I have with the US response. The other and more fundamental one is that the US has decided not to put the burden of the cost of meeting climate change on consumers of en high energy intensive products, but instead to subsidize consumers to buy low, low GHG emitting products, which is very much an economic second best option, puts a burden on taxpayers, elevates the deficit. What are, what are your most major disappointments with the US response to the Paris Agreement? Well, I, I was thinking maybe I would respond to your disappointments a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, I think the question about how we manage, uh, how we deal with China, uh, given, so China has a spectacular capacity to produce green products. They also have a huge amount of coal, which they got to get rid of, but, but that's true. They also subsidize it in all sorts of ways. And I think you have countries around the world, uh, particularly the US, but also in Europe, who look and realize that you could kind of let China produce all the green stuff that everybody needs by itself. I mean, it's that, it has that much expertise and that larger workforce. But it's also true that that would be a really risky thing to do for, uh, for the US and for uh, other countries. If you, I mean, all you have to do is look at what happened in, uh, between uh, Putin and Europe with respect to his cutting off natural gas. Nobody, nobody wants to be completely dependent on somebody else for energy. And by the way, this is energy that's already big, but over the, over the coming years, it'll become the main source of energy. So I think it's really hard. I think it's, it's, it's important at the same time that uh, I think that the, um, that the positive relation, China, uh, climate relationship between the US and China that we've seen before needs to get not reinvented, but needs to, 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 to become more, uh, more effective. John Kerry 
tried his best to do that. And so, and John Podesta is doing his best to do it also, but it, the, the, the difficulty is the tension in the larger relationship. So anyway, I think that, that uh, I don't look at what's happening with China at, with an across the board condemnation by any stretch. I think that, that there are concerns. There are plenty of people who will say, well, yes, yeah, Stern, you're right, but then you should, you should, you should consider this technology by technology. And if you're looking at re relatively lower end technology like so solar panels, just buy them from China because they'll be cheaper. So I don't have a view on that per se, but I think, anyway, I think that's a, that's a difficult question. Um, you, you were, con oh, the, 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 other, the, the, the other issue that you had was, uh, was with the US essentially using carrots rather than sticks um, with, their, with their policy. And um, that's where my uh, instinctive blend of policy and politics comes in. Because I look at that and I think like, we weren't gonna get it done with, with, with sticks. Uh, and I look at the people in, in the White House, I look at John Podesta, who's um, you know, a very old friend of mine and, 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 and great and is, has led on the um, implementation of the IRA. I think I think it's it's been a big success, and uh, I'm I'm sure it's not what um, what is most uh, uh, attractive to economists. But you got to get stuff done, and I think that that they were able to get stuff done in a really important way. Got it. Yes, you have a question. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Nathan. And I'm a recent graduate of Montgomery College here in the Washington, D.C. area, and I'm ultimately hoping to teach American history. And um, my question is, um, in reading your book, one thing that stood out for me was the intense and genuinely heartfelt personal commitment and dedication of President Obama and Secretaries Clinton and Kerry. Um, and um, and how such leadership is not something to be taken for granted and is something to be appreciated, to be fully appreciated. And um, I was wondering, do you have a story that you would say highlights President Obama and or Secretaries Clinton and Kerry's personal commitment to and involvement in the Paris Accords? Huh. Um. Well, they, they both made huge contributions going all the way back to Copenhagen, without which, in my humble opinion, which is an opinion that a great many people don't accept, but I, I think that, that, uh, that they were crucial, both of them. Hillary Clinton arrived uh, on the second to last day and, uh, and uh, conducted a series of meetings and made announcements that began to breathe some life and hope into the notion that that agreement could actually happen. And then Obama, um, uh, as we were talking about earlier, was quite instrumental in getting the final, the, the final two pieces that had, to get, uh, that had to get done to get the, the Chinese to accept them. So I think that those were really quite, uh, quite crucial. Um, and you know, I think Obama's, the, the role he played, as I was saying before, in the, in the 2014 deal with China, that deal, that joint announcement between the U.S. and China was the single most important thing that happened on the road to Paris. Um, because, you know, you, you had had countries that people were trying, the, the, the negotiators had been trying to negotiate uh, what I call an operational agreement, uh, not not the original framework agreement that goes back to 1992, but one that was more you know uh, um, concrete. For 20 years, one failure after another, and so even though we were f quite far along, and I think that people were you know had some tentative optimism uh, as we were kind of moving toward Paris in 2015. It was that agreement. It was it was the, the 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 sight of President Obama and President Xi walking, literally walking down the red carpet in the uh, in the Great Hall of the People, that absolutely stunned the world. I mean, there nobody in the press had had anticipated it. There there were no leaks. None of the none of the other countries thought this was happening, and the message it sent was that and that and I think the message that countries took away was we can actually get this done. And 
when you when you then fast forward to uh, to maybe a month or so before the Paris Agreement started, 180 countries had put forward their proposed uh, emission reduction targets, which was completely extraordinary. And they and it happened because of that deal between uh, Obama and Xi. So I think I, I guess I would point to that above all else for Obama. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And I think there's someone right behind. So yes, go ahead. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to speak with us and share your experiences. Um, there was something that really resonated with me, what you said. I can also consider myself neither an optimist or neither a pessimist. Um, so I, and you've talked a little bit about um, technology and the hope that as technology changes and evolves, what that offers for us. So you've done all this work. The Paris Agreement finally happens. It's put into effect. I think uh, a lot of people who are maybe skeptical of it or people who are naysayers to the progress that it offers talk about how reactionary these changes are and what are the long-term effects of these uh, changes that we're making to try and create a more sustainable world that we live in, um, especially I know electric vehicles. Some people are skeptical about those batteries and what happens long-term, all of these types of concerns. So once you create this agreement, get everyone on the same page, finally have an action uh, plan in place, the steps to take, what is done to make sure that the long-term sustainability of that plan can evolve to where countries are still on board with one another? Um, so that way the goals are still being met, but in the most sustainable fashion as technology continues to evolve and emerge. Yeah, well, I, I think the new technology we're talking about is technology that is that is sort of by definition sustainable, that if you can rely on uh, on technologies that don't, um, that don't require fossil fuels, you are sort of by definition making the world uh, much more sustainable. So I mean, I think that that's, I think that's kind of built in. I, and I also think that, look, all, all of this new stuff takes a certain amount of time for people to get used to, for people to think like the electric car is going to break down, or I don't really want an electric car, or whatever. But, but the 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 sort of trajectory that this is that 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 this kind of technology is on is. Uh, is really super powerful. I mean, the changes are being made incredibly fast. Uh, you have, move away from vehicles for a minute, I mean, it, the, the cheapest way to, to get uh, electricity in the world now is solar. It's cheaper to build an entire solar facility and run it than it is to just walk in and, and hit the on switch at a, at a fossil fuel, at a fo fossil fuel, um, uh, 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 Facility, um, so uh, so I, I think that I, I think that th these changes are going to happen. I mean, the the guy who the, there's a there's a guy who's got the uh, a sort of original name Kings Mill Bond sounds like from a movie, but um, but he's quite brilliant and uh, and he's done lots and lots of work uh, on this kind of thing. And and you know what he argues is you'll see over and over again historically. You go from cars, to, from horses to cars. You go from um, from uh, sailing ships to steamships. You go from you know one kind of technology to another. There's an incumbent technology. The new stuff comes along. They say it'll never work. You yeah you 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 can't get rid of cor uh, cars are a flash in the pan. You can't get rid of horses. I mean that this sort sort of stuff happens. It's happening now in spades. The pace at which it's happening is increasing, and people will get more and more used to it. I mean, if you look at electric cars, there were hardly any five years ago, and 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 they're they're just rising up the curve. So I think all of that is very encouraging. Like I said before to, uh, to Juliet, I mean, the, the biggest hurdle we have is getting past the, uh, the, the kind of resistance of the fossil fuel players. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. And yes, please come ahead. Great. Hi, Todd. Um, thanks. Uh, so you're talking some about this intersection between politics and policy. And one of the things that uh, I'm curious for your take on is it seems like a lot of times enacting climate policy uh, requires using up a lot of political capital. But there's times where it can create political capital. How do you think about the difference? Like when, when, when can climate action uh, be expensive in terms of political capital and when can it be generative in that sense? Well, what, tell me what you have in mind. 
Well, I, I mean, I think some of what we've seen, I work on state policy, and so some of what we've seen at the state level is that there's a lot of places where people thought uh, passing new standards or things like that were going to be a real death knell, and someone's going to have to do it and not expect to get reelected, and it hasn't actually cost that much at all. Right. Um, and so I think we've seen places where it's turned out to be more neutral, which is good. And obviously, there's folks who are pushing for greater action from Democrats, particularly. And so I think for certain constituencies, we see it it, it sort of builds up the bank account. Um, but it's still, I feel like the general talk around town is that it's very expensive. And I'm, I'm not sure if the reality always matches up with. Well, I think, I mean, I think it depends on, uh, on what you're looking at. I mean, the electric cars start off being more expensive and then they get to be less and less, less and less more expensive. And before we know it, they're going to end up being as, as inexpensive and or more inexpensive, particularly because once you get it, get the electric car, you don't need gas. Um, so, I mean, I think it, I think it depends. Obviously there's, there are things that we could do that are highly toxic politically. Um, nobody wants to talk about, uh, ending fracking in Pennsylvania if they, if they want to get elected. I mean, uh, the vice president has, has run into, um, to statements that she's, uh, she's made in the past on that front. So, um, I mean, this you just have to manage these things as best as you can. I I, I think that the uh, that the uh, if if I, if I was advising her, I would tell her to do exactly the same thing that she's doing now. You you you've got to be kind of practical about it and move as fast as you can, but not in a way that's going to kind of uh, completely upset the apple cart. And we're running. Thank you. We're running out of time, but we have one very quick last question. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, thanks a lot for your service in the government and uh, on the Paris Agreement. Uh, one of the strengths of the Paris Agreement is its strong foundation in science. And I was wondering how um, how did you find science most effectively communicated to you and to the other uh, national negotiators? Did did you read the um, you know, the summary for policymakers at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or was it briefings by John Holdren or other staff? It was Thanks. both. It was both of those things. <laughs> um, Holdren was great, uh, and I did I did read those summaries. But I always had a, I always had somebody on my team who was a science expert, so it it wasn't just that I would kind of try to wangle my way through the the, the summary, which is a lot longer than most summaries are. Um, but uh, so I, I always had a, had a science advisors. The president, I mean, John Holdren was the president's science advisor. And uh, and look, I, I think, you know, one place where I, where you, you sort of your question uh, reminds me of, uh, of a, a thought that I had do have in the book, which is that um, we had we'd started a, a, an organ, a, a group a grouping called the Major Economies Forum, which was hugely important and, and, and useful as a diplomatic matter. It was basically more or less the G20 countries, and actually nobody liked it more than Minister Shia. He thought it was very, no, really, he thought it was very effective. Um, he always liked the fact that we in the US would put the toughest issues facing us on the agenda for any of the three or four of these that we held each year. Uh, in the book, I say that we should re revitalize that major economies forum um, at the leader level, so at the presidential level, with um, prep preparatory meetings done by, um, by um, people uh, a notch down. Um, and that uh, the focus not being on negotiating something like the Paris Accord, but on decarbonization worldwide, and that I would start every meeting with a top level uh, scientist from around the world who's got expert uh, capacity to speak to non-scientists, a good communicator, just so that leaders can see every year, not just listening to people who are in their own government, maybe telling them the, the straight facts and maybe not, um, where, where are we at? What do we need to do more? So that, I mean, that's just one possible thing to do, but, um, but science is important and it's important that people who don't who aren't scientists understand it. Great message, thanks. Okay, and so now we're at time, but I'm gonna ask about Trump. Um, so, shocked, shocked. <laughs> oh my God. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so, you know, uh, negotiators from around the world will gather in Baku, um, Azerbaijan, you know, a matter of days after the election. At that point, Donald Trump could be the president-elect, or more likely, it's unclear, but let's play it out on the 
that that if Trump wins, either very clearly in the beginning or you know it's sorted out, what does that mean for climate diplomacy and the broader climate trajectory? Well, it'll mean um, it will certainly make the uh, the conference in Baku a uh, a big downer. <laughs> um, people will be very upset. People, I mean, we've been through this before. Um, but the fact that we've been through it before doesn't mean that it won't uh, resonate very badly. Um, we are, uh, you know, as we've both talked about in the course of this, um, not moving as fast as we need to be, even though we're making progress. Um, so in, in the immediate, uh, nobody else is going to drop out. It's not, people aren't going to say, well, the hell with this, or it's not going to work. They've been, again, they have been here before. But it will, uh, it will certainly send a very bad signal. And it's going to be important if that happens. I don't think it's going to happen, for the record. But if that happens, um, then a lot, a lot of sort of spontaneous organizations sprang up in the, in the immediate reaction to, um, to what Trump did in June of, uh, of 2021. And, uh, and I think that there is more that can be done, including more internationally, um, that organizations like that can do, um, if that you know if that comes to pass. But we're hoping it's not going to come to pass. And I'd like you to join me in thanking Todd, and of course, Politics and Prose, and also to say you can buy Todd's book and other books. There's no limit in how many books you can buy from Politics and Prose this evening, the greatest bookstore in America.